I will never forget this campaign. Thank you, Mr. President, and Mrs. Reed, administrators, for asking me to come. My friends have been here and they've told me about it. But one has to see it with a seeing of the eye. And I want to come back again. All in favor of the guy opposed the same sign and scary. When I come back, I'm going to bring a heavy coat and a hat. But I sincerely mean it when I say this has been an experience to see so many at camp meeting during the entire time and to find you so attentive to the word of the Lord. Our scripture was read from John the 13th chapter. The title of my message is one word, and that word is later. Later. We are living in what has been denominated the now generation. Folk want everything now. Now, while they're in high blood. Now, while they're mad with invasions. Because they are hopeless about the future, they want it now. Young folk don't even want to wait until marriage time. They want it now. The age of instant gratification. Now, riches when a lottery is being endorsed by state governments all over the world. Now, the homes that we used to think about for the future. Now, the cars that men of great experience and years usually drive. And this impatience is straining the morals and the finances and the health of men and women, boys and girls around the world. The word later is a frustrating word. It plagues them. It seems to point to a time that will never come. The word later lies beyond the vision of now over in the territory of faith. The word later is a teasing word. It's out of the reach of man's little grasping hand. Only children of faith can look forward to later as they ought to look. In the section that was read in our hearing, Jesus has come to the days of shadows during his experience on earth. The disciples are wonderstruck and fear trouble. Judas has already gone out into eternal darkness. And Christ uses a word. He said to them, Whither I go, you can't follow me now, but afterwards. Or as one version puts it, later. This is the second time this word has been used in this same chapter, and both times it was addressed to Peter. There has been the unique service of foot washing. Peter wanted to know, Lord, what's this all about? And Jesus said, what I do, thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter, later. And then in the section that was read in our hearing, the Lord is trying to tell them that the time of his departure is at hand. 
And they want to know, where are you going, Lord? And again he says, whither I go, you can't follow me now. But later, later, after the trials have come, later, after the testing time, you see, Peter would yet sleep through the awesome experience of Gethsemane. Peter would follow him afar off after his arrest. Peter would be arrested by the crowing of a rooster and only then find that great hour of bitter repentance. He's not ready yet. So the Lord said to him, later, later, the Apostle James says the trying of our faith worketh faith. St. Paul said, ye have need of faith. In every phase of our lives, we need patience, which is the fruit of faith. That is tried faith. You know I had a mischievous thought not long ago. It seems to me that if I had been the Savior, and if I had risen from the dead, the first person I would want to see would be Pontius Pilate. I would go to the tower of Antonio where his apartment was. I would walk right past his bodyguard, break open the door, snatch the cover off, and say, look at me, I'm back. I told you I was going to run as a kid. After that, I would have gone to the parsonages of Annas and Caiaphas, and I would have said, wake up! It's me! You didn't believe, but here I am! But I'm glad Jesus is the Savior. He appeared first to a trembling woman, scared and disillusioned. And after that, to his disciples behind the bolted door, scared for their skin. What about Pilate and what about innocent Caiaphas? Christ said, later for them, my church needs encouragement now. The first folk who will see me will be those who will benefit, those whose faith needs awakening, those who are full of sorrow and darkness and sadness. They need my presence, but what about the others? John said, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye, Pilate and Annas and Caiaphas, every eye shall see him. Later, but right now, he appears to his people, those who need him most. You see, his ways are not our ways. God doesn't think the way we think. He moves in the whirlwind and the tempest. And we limp along. We cannot keep up. We stumble and stagger and fumble and fall. We cannot follow his designs. And yet we think we are so smart. We want to dictate the terms of our own future. We've got to trust that with the Lord. Whatever needs adjusting and whatever needs recompensing, whatever needs to be straightened out, some secrets belong to the Almighty to his believing people, he says, later. They're so quick to ask, why do I have to suffer? Why do I have so many problems? Why do the saints drive both wagons while the gamblers in the theater crowd ride around in Rolls Royces? Why do we see more ways to have it so hard? The Lord is saying to his church today, later, don't lose faith afterwards. 
Surely a burden might be laid on you. And sure, it might bend you over. And surely it might gray your hair and fur up your brow. I've got a recompense. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which has great recompense of reward later. So today, in the words of that powerful song, we are tossed and driven on the restless sea of time. So must skies and howling tempests all succeed a bright sunshine. But in that land of perfect day, when the mists are rolled away, we'll understand it better by and by. Later. Later. Temptation's hidden snares often take us unawares. And our hearts are made to bleed for a thoughtless word or deed. We wonder why the test, when we're trying to do our best, but we'll understand it better later. Praise God for my hope, the blessed hope in the future. We're ridiculed for it, but it's all we got. And it is sure. It is as solid as the throne of God. There are some who say, I'm going to trust God in the tenth trial because he's already delivered me nine times. Now, I don't want to put that testimony down. I hear that every Wednesday night at my church when I'm there. Somebody gets up and says, I'm going to trust the Lord because of what he's done. Now, that's good. Ellen White says we have nothing to fear for the future except we forget how God has blessed and led us in the past. But I want to tell you, that kind of testimony is not the ultimate sign of throne. Listen to somebody else who was being pressed down, who in a bed would be wiped off the face of the earth. He said, though he slay me, yet will I serve him. There was nothing about what he's already done, no matter what he does. I'm going to hold on to God's unchanging hand. The Hebrew boys went into Nebuchadnezzar's furnace. While they were being interrogated, they said, O king, if you throw us in, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us. Now, if their testimony had ended right there, I wouldn't have the respect for them that I had. But they said, O oh, king, even if God does not deliver us, we're still not going to bow down. Anybody would go into a furnace if he knew God was going to snatch him right out. But it takes faith to go in, realizing you might be burned to toast. But they said, when it comes to serving God or serving you, we don't have a choice in the matter. Oh, no, no, no. We do have a choice. And our choice is made. We are going to serve God even if we die. No. I had no idea that I was supposed to talk to you again tonight. I heard the announcement when you did. But I tell you this, I wanted to leave you with these thoughts. Deep down in my soul, I want to be like those Hebrew boys. There are some who say, I won't serve God until I can see my way clear. They don't understand how finite they are. I've studied in anatomy that the part of your brain which interprets sight is in the back of your head, back there where they call it the occipital pole. Your eyeballs simply pick up images. These have to be transmuted to the back of your head by crisscrossing optical nerves, so that if I slap my hand, you pick up the image. By the time your brain tells you what it was, you don't even see the present. You see the immediate past, and yet there are people who think they're so wise they can't serve God until they can see their way clear. See what? You can't even see the present. 
We have to trust ourselves in the hands of a God to whom the future is clear. A God who sees through the mists and the shadows. And I tell you something, I have nothing, and if nothing should remain, nothing by him will still be sung. The Lord will make a way somehow. I'm going through by the grace of God. No matter how many apostates rock the church, I'm going through with God's people. Nothing in my right hand, nothing in my left hand, still I will trust in the Lord until I die. And it is so sweet to trust in Jesus. Deep down in my soul, I know that a better day is coming. I know there's a bright side somewhere. I know that if anybody is going to enjoy heaven, it's been those who've suffered so much down here. Those who've been oppressed and refused and abused and mistreated, who've been deprived, they are going to find heaven especially precious. Those who lean and languish on beds of affliction, heaven is going to be more wonderful for those who endure until later. God tests our faith with triumph. By and by is not just a slogan for Adventists. By and by is a reality already by faith. There will be no by and by without obedience now. There will be no by and by without patience now. God has told us to hold on. If the door doesn't seem to open, he never told us to open the door. He told us to knock. But you might say, I've been knocking. Then keep on knocking. Our responsibility is to do what the Lord has told us to do. His responsibility is to take care of his part of the bargain. And the knock is in his hands. Oh, my brothers and sisters, our responsibility is what we refer to as present truth. That's the now responsibility. God takes good care of the future for his people. But we have our responsibility now to obey and believe and demonstrate present truth. Everyone who understands it ought to make sure that nothing on earth, nothing can come between his soul and the Savior. And when one understands that, he will relish obeying God's Ten Commandments. The Bible says, if ye love me, keep my commandments. That present truth. Present truth means that we'll uphold God's standards. Dress reform is present truth. Ellen White says, the line of demarcation between Christian and worldling is becoming fuzzy. There was a time you could look at members of the Lord's River Church and they were distinctive and distinguishable. But now, in many corners where I go, the line of demarcation is fuzzy. The church is full of fuzzy wood who seem to be embarrassed about the standards of the most holy church. This is present truth. I was just across the way in a theater. And I will tell you, with all that I've experienced here this week, something happened to me in a moment over there that gives me a richer and deeper respect for the Brooklyn organization. That stage where the stars get in the theater, that stage, there's a little sign. I imagine someone else saw it besides me. And that sign is addressed to the artists and the actors and actresses. And it says, we have a family theater here. And in spite of the pervasive permissiveness of our day, we will uphold our 
these are people who are for his bed at a camp. But they're telling all of these so-called liberated, foul mouth show people not here. I say God bring the people or to look to God's standards and say to the devil and the wild, hitherto shalt thou come and no further. This is present truth. Present truth deals with hell. These bodies are the temples of the Holy Ghost. Present truth means that we have to set a God about our diet. Got to be careful what we take into these body tests. Got to be careful, careful how we treat these body tests. For the Holy Ghost resides within us. And the body must not be defiled. That is the truth. Not only must we practice health reform, we've got to spread the good word. Would you say amen out there? The Holy Ghost is not going to be poured out upon us. Just so we can go to work and come home and eat a good meal and go to bed. The principal reason the Holy Ghost will be poured out in the latter rain is to get us ready for the coming of Christ and that we might witness with power. Ellen White says, those who care not for the salvation of their brothers and their sisters, their neighbors and their friends are in a lost condition. Sitting up in church, Paying tithe, adhering to norms, but law. And the evidence is not the judgment of a preacher. It's the fact that you do not share your faith with anyone else. Chastening might come for now, but later. But let me quote it in Hebrews 12. Now, no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous, nevertheless, and the word literally means later, nevertheless, afterward, it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them that are exercised thereby. In the spring of this year, we live in a new home, a new place. I went out in the yard, and I took up a little soil. And I went down and I paid dearly for fertilizers and mulches. And I brought it and mingled it with the soil. I dug and I watered and I did everything I knew to do. And I opened some little holes. And I took out of a box some tomato plants. You all say tomato. I took out some tomato plants. And I set them in the hole. And I tenderly pulled the soil around them that I had so laboriously prepared. And you know what happened? You who have done this will understand what I'm about to say. As I was just handling those tomato plants, a fragrance came from them. And I began to smell and visualize tomato. I saw them just so large and nice and round and kissed just right by the sun, rosy and red. Then I saw them light, garnished on my plate. I had visions of sharing them with my secretary and friend. And all I was doing was putting them in the ground. No chastening for the present seemeth to be joy. Nevertheless, later, all I had to do was keep on toiling. All I had to do was keep on watering. And all of a sudden, the great big green ones came. And I went every day, every day, to examine my, my, my bushes. And finally, I saw one begin to turn yellow. Every day! I kept on visiting until finally I went back there and three of them were blood red. I pulled them off and the one that I pulled off first, I mocked it. I'm going to relish that one. In a few days, I was taking them by the basket 
for to my secretary and friends at the general conference? That's the what God says. There is proof that will be born through the chastisement of the priest. Might not be joyous now. Might not be fun now to go through what you have to go through. But the Lord says all things work together for good to them that love the Lord. After what? Later, you're going to eat the fruit. You're going to enjoy what is coming your way. There are people even here, I've talked to them, who seem to have a heavy burden concerning the nature of Jesus Christ. Well now, beloved, I'm going to put it in simple language. Jesus is verily God as though he were never man. And as verily man as though he were never God. And you and I in our finiteness cannot understand it. God didn't ask you to explain it. He asked you to believe it. Well, when will we ever understand? Later, it will be the science of the saved throughout the generations of the coming eternity. We will study all about this great mystery. Don't even think that you can pin hold Jesus the way you can an ordinary man. Some things are hidden from us. The Bible says in 1 Peter 1, even angels desire to look into some of these things. They don't even understand it. But in the words of that song sung so beautifully, they bow before the throne of God crying, Holy, Holy, Holy. One scholar said the reason they say it three times is because ours is a triune God. Once for the Father, once for the Son, once for the Holy Ghost. And when we all get to heaven, later in God's appointed time, Many of these mysteries will be understood by those of us who, like angels, desire to look into them. One day, Jesus made a blind man see. And the Pharisees gathered around him. And the scribes trying to find fault with Jesus. And they began to ply the man with questions. Who did what and why did he do it? And the man just kept saying, I don't know. I don't understand. I don't know. They became impatient. They must have thought, you are a pretty sorry disciple. You don't seem to know anything. That man responded, but this I do know. Whereas I was blind, now I see. Might not be able to explain every move that God makes. But there's something I can tell you. I'm not the same fellow I was about 35 years ago when God picked me up off Market Street and took me out of that gang I was running with and converted me to this blessed truth and sent me away to prepare for the ministry. I'm not what I ought to be. I'm not what I used to be, bless God. Muslim knocked on my door. Wanting to debate. He said so. I said, well now, if we debate, what will we use as the ultimate authority? I use the Bible. But you don't believe in that. You use the Koran. I don't believe in that. So who's going to settle the argument? And he looked at me and I looked at him. I said, now, we might as well talk about football. We're wasting our time. He said, all I know is the Christian faith is ridiculous. I said, before you throw it away, 
fighting the change in me. You got to explain to me why I have changed. You got to tell me why the things I used to love I now hate. I quit smoking 37 years ago and now it makes me sick to smell it. I quit. And I'd rather fight than switch as the cigarette ad goes. I ever had. 
my old college roommate was also at the general conference. And we are uh, fast friends all these years. And if he ever reads a good book, he'll call me and tell me to get it. One day he called me. He said, CD, there's a little book. You can read it in one sitting. It's written by our friend, Dr. Walton Brown. He said, go buy it. Well, I've known him long enough to take his counsel, so I wouldn't get the book, but I was busy. So I threw the book on my desk, and before long it got covered up. And I went for weeks without reading that book. And one day coming in off a trip, everything was caught up. There were a few minutes before time to eat. So I decided to see why he told me to buy that book. And I want to tell you something. I think it's called Home at Last. If you haven't read it, you better get it. By Dr. Walton Brown, who had been in the education department at the General Conference. He's there now working with the General Conference. When I opened that book, I couldn't put it down. Never have I read such a fascinating account of later taken from the Bible and the spirit of prophecy as Dr. Brown's little book. And I want to use some of that to close with. He, he pictures multiplied millions of us going to glory. We're already on the cloud. And we're moving amongst each other with angels leading us and making introductions. There are fathers and mothers looking for their children. There are children looking for their parents. They are uncles and aunts trying to get the families together. How different they look. Actually, Dr. Brown's book is merely a compilation and arranging of quotations from the Bible and the Spirit of Bible. So nearly every single word is something he simply took and put into a new context. How different they look. They had been sick. They had been old and weak. I am a photographer, an amateur photographer. Years ago, in my mother's last illness, I went and bought a movie camera just so I could take her picture before she was called to rest. And the last movies I have of my mother, she is so weak, a sister has to walk along beside her. But later, when she comes out of the tomb, wearing the bloom of eternal youth, she's not going to need any support. Later, when we form this grand reunion in the sky, some were old. Now they bear the bloom of youth. All evidence of ill health is left in the grave. Why don't you say amen? Talking about later now. You got to have faith to believe this. They are glad to see us. We are glad to see them. Then shall we know, even as also we are known. Jesus speaks and welcomes his children to the new life as immortal beings. We look down beneath us where dead bodies and ruins are everywhere. Those who were not destroyed by falling mountains and hail and the plagues are consumed by the brightness of his coming. We are heading straight toward Orion. And then Dr. Brown gave me something that for my mind was absolutely fascinating. He talks about relative speed. He said when a man is walking, a horse is fast compared to a walking man. A train is fast compared to a horse. A jet plane is fast compared to a train. And when our astronauts went into outer space, they were traveling at more than 25,000 miles per hour. But because they were so high up above the earth, they had no sensation of moving at all. 25,000 miles an hour, that's fast. That's not fast enough to go to heaven in seven days. So then Dr. Brown, with his sharp mind, begins to make some calculations. He reminds us that light travels at better than 186,000 miles per second. And here we are with just seven days for the round trip 
to earth and back to glory. We've got to be traveling faster than the speed of light. In other words, he said, we are calculated at close to five light years per hour. Ain't that something? Astronauts bragging about 25,000 miles per hour. We traveling at five light years per hour. And yet we don't have that sensation of rushing anywhere. And then, reading from the Spirit of Prophecy, Dr. Brown includes, we stop in outer space on the Sabbath. And Jesus is going to address the redeemed. Many on board never kept the Sabbath. I hear that my old granddaddy was a saint. He was a Methodist preacher. He never heard of the Sabbath. If he was the kind of man I heard he was, then old man George Reeves is going to be sitting there when the chariot stops and the Lord begins to have Sabbath service and he's going to wonder, what is it all about? The Bible says those who enter the city of God have got to have a right to be there. And in order to have that right, you got to keep all of God's commandments. Old man George Reeves is going to keep the Sabbath before he gets the glory. Amen. Dr. Brown said, we won't be idle along this journey. We'll be seeing old friends. We'll be glimpsing Bible heroes. We'll see Adam lofty in height and of majestic form. We'll hold some conversations with angels, our guardian angels. Imagine an angel saying to you, you remember when you were hauled into court for your faith? They were talking about putting my uh, commandment keeping friends to death. And you had to go to court. And the case was stacked against you when all of a sudden a young lawyer came out of the audience dressed in a gray suit, a white shirt and a tie, and began to defend you. Why, well, that was me. That was me. We're told in volume three of Selected Messages, angels in human form will defend God's people in court. These angels will tell you about times when you almost were smashed and mangled on the highway. Suddenly your car veered out of danger. That was me. That was, I did that for you. And you remember when you were almost out of food? And a stranger knocked at the door, and you welcomed him in, and let him eat with you? That was me. Doesn't the Bible say we'll entertain angels unaware? Through the centuries, I never read this. With all my reading, I never read this until I saw what Dr. Brown had extracted. Through the centuries, certain angels have spent their time making crowns. Now come on, how many of you knew that before? I just gave you something that I got from somebody that you never knew before. Angels spending their time making crowns. We will receive them at the end of the journey. Adam was 622 years old when Enoch was born. When Adam was 687, Enoch brought his boy Methuselah to the old man to be blessed. 300 years later, Enoch, the first of Adam's son to go to heaven, will be in that crowd. Adam, weaving through, trying to find Enoch. Elijah, weaving through the crowd, trying to find Elijah. He's been gone more than 2,800 years. And when we see one another, when I see you, and you see me, we won't be saying hello. We'll be saying hallelujah. Hallelujah. We are here by the grace of God. As we near the New Jerusalem, certain angels speed ahead to get everything ready. Now we are moving at five light years per hour. And yet these angels take off and leave. 
They're going to get things ready. And as we approach the city, there is that cry, lift up your hands, O ye gates. Be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors, that the King of glory might come in. Lift up your hands, O ye gates, that the righteous nation that keepeth the truth might enter in. And the angels swing open the door, and the thundering tread of the righteous shall be heard going into the city of God. I can just see people getting their first glimpse and turning around saying, Thank you, preacher, for running that effort in my time. Thank you, Elder, for having kept me so that I could renew my covenant. Thank you for giving me a Bible study, sister. Thank God. I've never seen a righteous man dying who was sorry he knew Jesus. Then come the hawks. There's all that book you want to read. Here come the hawks. And the Lord's going to give us hawks. There's another book at the General Conference. His name is Charles L. Brooks. He is a sweet singer in Israel. Everywhere I go, folk think I am he. But I'm not. The other night somebody ran up on stage and said, Pastor Brooks, there's only one problem I want you to sing. Nobody ever accused me of singing, but later. When he hands me my heart, whatever's wrong down my throat, he's going to straighten it out. And old CD is going to sing like CL. Not only that, I'm going to play on my heart, ladies and gentlemen. Later. This is the blessed home. Crowns heavy with stars are placed on our heads. We've taught that in order to have a star on your head, you got to win a soul. There's nothing wrong with that. But i got some new insights for you. Those who have mingled zeal with pity for the poor, the orphans and the repent press, those who have helped those who are afflicted, those who have reached out to God's pitiful, oppressed people with a helping hand are going to have stars for the gifts they have given. Let's say amen out there. Hey, hey. In Gethsemane, Jesus was almost to die when an angel came and wiped the death view and showed him a vision of later. And the Bible says he saw the travail of his soul and was satisfied. He saw you, every one of you. He saw me. And he saw our potential if he should go through that ordeal. And he saw that we might go to heaven if he died for our sins. And when he saw it, he was willing to suffer now for the glory that would come to him. How about you? Two drunks were drinking at the same bar. And they got into an argument over who had the best wife. This is a true story. And so when they got so vehement in their argument, they decided to bet. They put up ten dollars a piece to determine who had the best wife. And they stormed out of the bar and started toward the home of one of the men. When he got there, he had to put on a good show. So he banged on the door as though the house were on fire. His wife came and opened the door with a smile. Oh, if you did. He's got another drunk that's bad enough to have one drunk coming home. He got two. He stepped in and said, this is my friend here, and we're hungry. I want you to get up out of that bed and go in that kitchen and fix us something to eat now. And she smiled and said, yes, she is. Isn't that what all you like ladies would say? That other drunk got sober. He 
He pulled out $10. He said, ain't no important going to my house. You have one. When this fellow went into his kitchen, he was alone. And he too was sober. Caught a hold of his wife's arm. True story. And he said, dear, why are you so good to me? I treat you like a dog. I abuse you. I waste our money. You can't live as well as you ought to live. You can't even get a new dress now and then because I'm squandering our means on liquor. Yet you never fail me. Why? Why? Why are you so good to me? And that saint turned around and said, I'll answer that. You see, very soon now Jesus is coming. And when he comes, he's going to bring relief to all of his people. When Jesus comes, all of my suffering, all of my trials, all of my aggravation will be over forever and ever, and I will have millions of years to relax. Millions of years to get over all that you've done. I'll have millions of years of perfect peace and perfect joy in a perfect land with perfect neighbor. But when Jesus comes, all your pleasure will be over. You don't have much time left. So I decided that since you have so little time, Whatever I could do to make your last days a little more enjoyable, I ought to do it. Because you are running out of time. As for me, later, there is an eternity of joy. The story is not sensationalized, but it does seem gloriously. It says that that husband stood there, perhaps for the first time, drinking in the reality of her response. The tears began to flow. He was clinging now to his wife's arm as he slid down to his knees on the bar with his face wet in tears. He said, I don't want you to leave me down here. Whatever it takes to be saved with you, I want to do it. Will you pray for me? The last I heard of that story, husband and wife, we're rejoicing in one faith and one hope that later, sooner than most of us realize, Ellen White says it will be to most of us in the church an overwhelming surprise. The devil makes us think we've got a long time. The Bible says he knows it, that he has for a short time. Sooner than most of us realize, the heavens are going to split wide open and in matchless glory. The King of Kings will come riding down the skies, clothed with fire and light. The thunder and lightning of his chariot wheels will split the air. The mountains will move out of their places. The islands of the sea will be swallowed up. The ocean shall boil as a kettle on a stove. And only those, only those with holiness inside will be able to respond to holiness above and like them like little pieces of steel drawn to a magnet we will be caught up to meet him in the air later i plan to be there how about you let's pray